So we have a few things to talk about this week. Um, one thing that I wanted to show um, is um, a colleague um, who has um, an interesting way of writing uh, controllers in JavaScript. I, I know we have um, some Kiali folks here to uh, show us some new Kiali features. And also um, have a few work items that have been marked for one, two, but currently don't have owners. And I'm going to try to persuade people to, to take them if they're developers. Um, so maybe uh, we can get started with um, the uh, this prototype. Uh, Mandana works with me here at IBM Research, and she's uh, an expert in programming languages. Uh, Mandana, can you show us uh, what you've been experimenting with? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, so I have been basically working on a JavaScript library for Istio uh, so that uh, when you execute the code, it actually generates the YAML so that you don't have to know uh, all of the intricacies of the Istio YAMLs uh, and that you, we can uh, you know, capture some patterns there that are common. Um, so uh, first of all, what I have here is a Kubernetes cluster where I just install Istio and I install the book info uh, application without anything else. Um, so the first thing that a user may want to do is to actually expose a service. So here we have this expose service uh, function that where I just pass it some parameters. I say, you know, well, I give it a name. I say this is the external port that I want. This is the name product page is the name of the service that I want exposed. Uh, and then I just give it uh, this information here about the endpoint. Uh, and now when I, if I execute this, um, let me actually execute it. Can, can people see my screen? Yes. Yep. Okay. So if I execute that, it basically generates the two uh, YAMLs that I need, so the gateway and the virtual service. And by using that, I actually didn't have to know anything about uh, what a gateway or a virtual service CRDs are. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this is that there's some fields here that have been automatically filled for me. So, for example, the selector here, Istio, this name, this envoy name was looked up. So, so the Kubernetes cluster was queried, and this label was automatically generated for me. The other piece of information here that was automatically generated was this, was this internal port number. So, again, uh, this method queried Kubernetes and obtained that information and filled in this YAML for me. So what I can do with this is that I can just directly send it to, uh, uh, you know, I can pipe that to my Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and if I do that, so initially, you know, I couldn't see anything on my product page. And now if I uh, look at it again, um, now I can, I've exposed that service, so now I can see the book info. Uh, so now because we, the book info comes with uh, three versions of reviews, which is not very realistic, but that's what happens. Uh, if I keep refreshing, it goes to all these different uh, uh, versions of reviews, as we all know. So let's suppose that I want, what I wanted to do was to actually only use version two. So what I can do is to write the lines of code here that, uh, that says set version for reviews to be v2. Uh, incidentally, what I also have yeah, is this piece of code that I will show you later that is this, this destination rule manager that actually is listening for deployments to be created and deleted and automatically generates uh, the destination rule uh, YAML that I also need. So if I take a look at my destination rules here uh, that have been automatically generated for me, um, I see that I have all of them here. And if I look at the one for reviews, Uh, I see that it automatically has generated all of the final list of versions based on the way that these things were labeled. And, and I will go over the code for how that was written in a little bit. So now if I, uh, if I uh, generate uh, for this code that sets everything to v2, I just apply that. Uh, and then you know, it creates uh, this new virtual service uh, uh, YAML. But as a user, I don't necessarily have to know anything about that. Now, if I refresh, we see that it worked and it all goes to V2. Uh, so we can keep on going now. So for example, let's say that I wanted to have a root rule where 
50% uh, of the traffic goes to V1 and 50% goes to V3. So if I do that, uh, again, uh, when I refresh, it only goes to V1 and V3. Uh, so the, the next rule is a little bit more complicated. So it's, it's basically saying that if the user is uh, uh, name is JSON, then go to V2. Otherwise, go to V1. And actually, the set weight, this, this is the more uh, general uh, um, abstraction that we have here. Uh, and the uh, really set weights and set version are actually sugar on top of that. So this actually exposes a little bit more of what the uh, uh, what that abstraction is, where you really have a source and a destination, and you can you can give attributes to that. So now, if I uh, apply that, uh, you see that for everybody it goes to V1, and again, if I uh, go to sign in as JSON, then I go to V2. So um, this is a, a nice way of, of doing uh, the programming in JavaScript. Um, but I was especially excited about the automatic creation of the subsets. Yes, absolutely. So let's say that, let's say that uh, you know, I, have, I wanted to create, for example, a new, uh, a new version for reviews. So version V4, which actually in this case happens to be exactly the same thing as V2. But let's say I create that. So I create that. What happens is that I have this process that's running on the background that actually watches for the creation of deployment and then updates that piece of metadata, destination rules metadata automatically. So if I now look at that, um, so this is the uh, reviews destination rule, you see that it was added. Uh, if I delete it, again, it's going to be removed again. So I think maybe we should open up a little discussion on if you'd like the idea of writing controllers in JavaScript as opposed to uh, creating CRDs and then extending Pilot and Galley to have these kind of controllers. Does anyone have any thoughts about this? Uh, what's the advantage of writing them in JavaScript? Uh, so the advantage of writing this in JavaScript is that as a user, I have only a set of abstractions. Uh, I don't actually have to know anything about the YAML. Uh, some of the fields in the YAML is actually filled in for me automatically. Uh, and then what this destination rule manager does is that if this is based on, uh, this is a Node.js Kubernetes library. Uh, what this does is that it's a watcher. It's watching for deployments, and whenever deployments are created, or deleted, it automatically updates the uh, destination rules piece of metadata. So as a user, I never have to worry about that. And this is something that can be deployed as a container, you know, together with Istio that's running in the background. I never have to know about it. And that piece of meta metadata can just be maintained for me without me as a user ever having to worry about it. This technique seems like it really simplifies people who have custom configuration that they want to do and custom reactive things they want to do to program the STL mesh when changes happen. Um, it also seems like a great way to prototype new sorts of features. And that's why I wanted the user group to take a look at it and, and give us, give Mandana her thoughts, our thoughts on it. Uh, I think that's like a great option when we want to automate some, some deployment. Uh, because actually, for example, for me, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm just having some placeholder in, in the YAML file and then try to change this when deploying, depending on the environment. So that's like give us um, like a more a more abstract um, uh, way to do it without uh, going uh, inside the YAML file and change, change variables or change the placeholders. Mm -hmm. So last week I presented a, a, a template feature I wanted to add to STO control. And the feedback I got was that we wanted more custom CRDs and level features and less templating. This is a, a sort of a middle ground. Um, it's it's a controller, but it's sort of in user space, not as part of the control plane. So anyway, if anyone has any future thoughts on that, uh, let us know. I, I will forward anything to Mandana, or she can can uh, you can talk to her directly. 
Is this, so, I mean, just I just have one question for the group. Is this something that you you see uh, as being useful for ECU users, or do you think that uh, ECU users wouldn't want to write JavaScript? Or uh, I wonder if there's any feedback of that nature. This strikes me as something that makes an excellent example of what someone can accomplish on top of Istio and what we might invite our users to do. Um, I would love to see a similar example written in Golang just for parity's sake. Yes, yes. I think JavaScript, I mean, it's a familiar language, but yes, we would like to support that in lots of different languages, Java, Go, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to uh, underline that the customer really has the power, or the user really has the power to choose how they go about doing this. Mm -hmm. And if it's possible, I wonder, can we express as a template language? Because if you look at the audience of Istio, it's more about operators. Um, so the operators, I don't know if they would be confident enough to writing a programming language. Um, so I, I think template would be easier for them. Yeah, I think that uh, so there was an interesting blog about you know, templating YAML versus uh, you know, outside of the context of Istio versus programming languages. And there's definitely people who believe on both sides of that discussion uh, and, and were very kind of set in their, in their way of thinking. So we probably want both. But what happens with templating languages is that, you know, you reach the limit of programmability at some point. Uh, and you don't want to put a full-fledged programming language in your templating. Um, so, so then people always find something wrong with it because the thing that they wanted to write isn't expressible, et cetera, and they keep adding, you know, like people, for example, aren't happy with Helm, et cetera. So I think what, what's nice about the, the JavaScript, the, actually the, the PL approach, is that you just leave it to the user to be able to, you know, write whatever they want, and maybe you write that for certain ops personas who aren't comfortable in code at all, this isn't for them. But on the other hand, this could be for a developer who wants to build tools for an ops persona that would be easy, easy to, to develop. So for example, you could imagine that you say under certain conditions, you know, this is how I want to change my routing and be able to codify that in a programming language. So if, if, I, if I watch, I'm watching and I see something in my, uh, you know, in my logs, or if I'm analyzing the traffic and this is what I, you know, detected, then in that case, you know, this is how to, you know, I can change the, the routing uh, or do whatever gets the conversion because it's gone bad. Uh, and then that, this is a new tool that can be rapidly developed by somebody to be used then by an ops person. Yeah, there's a, there's a company called Pulumi, P-U-L-U-M-I, that's uh, got a different approach to, do, to doing deployments of stuff. And in general, they've created a strongly typed set of wrappers around, for example, for Google Platform, they've created strongly typed wrappers around all types of, of Google objects, so VMs and networks and all that kind of stuff. And you end up writing a little program that creates all these objects, links them in a strongly typed fashion, uh, perform, you can perform validation on it. And then when you say run, it just effectively generates the templates uh, that they, they the, the YAML that's necessary to program the system accordingly. Yes, absolutely. So Pulumi is completely related to what we're doing. Uh, and in fact, we were somewhat inspired by that. And, and we're, you know, in our programming model, we're, we're trying to build stuff for IBM assets uh, in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that vein. Uh, but the approach that we're having is that we're based on operators. We're based on CRD. So we have this strong sort of Kubernetes rather than having, you know, these wrappers that just do REST API calls and they're done. Uh, we're, our uh, approach is to build the program model on top of operators that are doing the lifecycle management of these various resources. And so um, what that gives us is that there's some health checks that, this, that the uh, operators themselves are, are, are doing to maintain the health of the resources that they're managing. And then we build on top of that. So that would be, that's one way in which we're different than Pului, but it's different, definitely the same space. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it, that's the, probably the most related thing that's out there is Pului. Yes. Yeah, I heard, I think Lynn asked about templating approach versus a programming language approach. I found that the templates were great for writing, but for some of the defaults, like the port number, I found that um, I was using JSON path to try to get the get the defaults out of other Istio objects, and those JSON paths turn out to be much more complicated than you would think to write. It's 
nicer to be able to, to write them in, in a programming language. Yes, and also in the programming language, you're sort of reusing, you know, you could have a variable name for something and then just reuse that variable name that you just pass around, uh, you know, for something that repeats itself in like five different YAMLs. Uh, so those are like just basic things that a PL language gives you um, that you may not have necessarily in a template setting. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Montana. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, the next thing on the agenda is uh, we had been promised a demo of some of the new features of Kiali, and maybe to hear what's coming up for Kiali. Um, do we have Matt and his team? Yeah, I'm here. Can people hear me? Yes. Okay, and I'll see if I can actually uh, share my screen. It says it's sharing. Uh, can people see my slide right here? Yes. Uh, oh, I don't want that. Okay. So I'm going to do a uh, a brief presentation on Kiali. Uh, I gave one, I think, maybe three or four uh, user group meetings ago. Um, at that point, we only kind of went through just the uh, kind of the graph part of Kiali. Uh, I know last, uh, actually it wasn't last one, one before the meeting, there's a lot of questions about, you know, kind of Kiali and where we're going with things um, with that. So I'm going to go through and kind of give a brief update on where we are with Kiali, and then I can have like a slide at the end talking kind of about uh, our, our future plans with it. Um, so this is kind of just the simple like, you know, product page on um, place to get more information about Kiali. Uh, our, our main website is Kiali.io. Uh, it's Kiali under GitHub. We have right now, like our official issue tracker is under uh, JBoss in their Jira instance. Um, but we found that for some users, it's not too handy to uh, enter issues there. So we also accept issues being opened by our, uh, through the GitHub issues. And then we also have a list here of some of our social things that you can kind of click on to find more information, uh, you know, either through Twitter or Medium. There's also a YouTube channel in there. So I'll start off just kind of, you know, describing what Kiali is. Uh, we're an Istio observability console. I uh, need to see what's happening within your mesh, find out information about the health of things, how much traffic is flowing between your different components, uh, different metrics and graphs and such in there. We also have some mesh configuration management uh, within Kiali itself. There's things like wizards if you want to set up uh, routing between components that way. You can also view and edit YAML configuration files to allow you to set up and configure things any way you want. We are a open source project uh, under the Apache 2.0 license. Uh, currently, most of our contributions are coming from Red Hat, but we're looking to expand and grow our community. So if people want to help out with Kiali, please let us know if you have any uh, thoughts or comments on things that you want done in there. Uh, you know, please reach out to our, our community. Uh, what I forgot on our previous slide actually is our mailing list. We do have a mailing list that you should be able to find that from Kiali.io. Uh, and if you're using something like the Istio quick install, uh, Kiali is installed by default. So if you've done that, you might have already played around with Kiali or, or seen it. Uh, it can also be optionally installed using the Helm installer. I don't believe it's installed by default. You need to pass a parameter for Kiali to uh, be in there. So that's all I have for kind of the main slide parts. Uh, and I'll go off on some uh, demos now. Oh, shoot. One second. I need to stop sharing my screen because I lost my network and that's what I need to access things. Can people still hear me? Oh, we can hear you. Okay. Yep. I'm just wondering if I've lost my network completely or not. I know I'm connected to the internet, but I might have lost connection to my cluster. Which would not be good. Uh, 
All right, uh, I might have a backup plan. Yeah, I think I lost my network to my cluster for some strange reason. Okay. So I'll share my screen again. Sorry about that, guys. I'm assuming people can see my screen again. So I'm on a backup cluster right now, which does not have things configured the way I wanted it to for the demo, but um, that's okay. So. For people who have not seen Kiali, this is uh, what our current version of Kiali looks like. This is based, I think, on either master or close to master. So if there's any kind of bugs that pop up, it might just be because of that. Uh, normally, when you access Kiali, you'll be granted access to, or you'll be shown access to the overview page, which is a brief overview of what's happening within your cluster. Here we can see that there's five different uh, namespaces, we have information about what's running in the namespaces, such as book info, six applications, uh, a bit of traffic information, uh, and other things in there. So from here, if there's any problems, you will get a kind of either a red or an orange indication that something's wrong in your cluster, and then quick links to go to something's in there. So if something's on fire, you should have access to go quickly to that. I'm just trying to see if my clusters up and running so I have that in my other one, but I think it's it's dead. Okay. So we'll continue on instead with this one doesn't have an error set up in it. So here is our graph view that we have and this is showing you what's happening uh, between your, your services or your microservices in here, your different workloads and different applications. Uh, right now, this is looking at the book info uh, demo that I'm sure most people are very well aware of. Um, you have things like the side panel. There's various different ways you can render and view your, your graph. Right now, it's a versioned app graph, so it kind of groups things together by uh, application and version. But if you don't want that, you can get things like a workload graph, which will separate things by workload. But I'll just go back to the version app graph as that seems to be the nicest one uh, that we have in here. Uh, in my other example, I was going to show I had a fault injection set up, um, and it was quite nice as it would show you the edge being read from a fault injection. And then if you clicked on the side panel under response codes, it would show you a 500 response and then a flag value. So if you had something like a uh, fault injection or a circuit breaker or something else that was activated, you'll actually know what was happening uh, in your graph, but it's not very interesting here as it's not enabled in this environment. There's uh, a few different things that you can do. Um, as I said, there's different ways you can set up your graph to be shown. You can show different things on the edges. So if you want to see the request per second, you can see that. Uh, if you want to see, I think there's a, a percentage uh, request percentages, so you can see like for these right now it's 50-50 because there isn't any uh, routing being applied, and also things like response time. So if you're doing something like deploying um, multiple versions and you have a new version rolling as a canary and you're seeing that the response time is really high, you can use this to kind of view that information in the graph. There's also some things like badges that we have applied, so if you have a um, Click on product page here. It has a virtual service that's applied to the product page service. You can know it's in there. And there's some other things in here, such as um, circuit breakers being applied. You have it all underneath here under our display option. Uh, if you have a missing sidecar, so there's, you know, we have a check that if you're running pods without a sidecar, you can know about that within the graph. And there's also some security information. So with the security information, it will show you what um, what connections are being done over mutual TLS or not. Um, so that's a very brief overview of the graph. There's tons of different options that we have in here, things you can do for changing it. Does it show the circuit breaker if it's triggered, or does it just show if it's configured to have one? We have a badge that will show that it's configured to have one. If there's actually a circuit breaker that has been uh, triggered, the line will be uh, either orange or red, depending on how many failures there are. And then you can go into the response code, and under here, there'd be a flag 
with a hover over that would tell you if a circuit breaker was activated and what percentage of the request for that error code was triggered by a circuit breaker. Same thing for something like fault injection or other things in there. So this is a brief overview of our graph part of things. We also have a lot of different um, other pages that we can go into. We have a list of applications. This goes through and basically groups things together by the app labels. If you see on the page here, your product page, which has a V1 uh, workload and a product page service. And since it's under the, uh, so they both have the app label applied to it, uh, it's grouped under the product page as the app label matches. So we can go through and look at any application you have, such as the detail page. This will show you what workloads are available under that application, what services are available. We have health checks here. Uh, so here we're checking the pod status, you know, if the pods are healthy. We're also checking things such as the uh, network traffic. So if there's errors in the network, we will mark something as being unhealthy. We have traffic pages, which will give you a overview of the traffic that's flowing through this particular um, application. We also have things like the inbound and outbound metrics. So you can see what's happening um, through this. You can also expand it, view full page. If you have Grafana configured and installed, you also have a link that will take you to Grafana. We have similar things for all the, uh, for something like a, a workload. You can go through workload and see what's happening with things in your graph. So you can see here for the details V1 workload, we have, you know, what type it is, it's deployment, the app and version labels that are applied, uh, the health of this workload. We also can see what pods are in here, if the pod's healthy or not, uh, other information with that. We also see what services uh, this workload is being accessed through. You can get traffic around the workload, so you can see what this workload is talking to and what's talking to this workload. If you want to see logs, we have the logs in here as well. So if you're noticing something is acting a little bit weird in your graph and you're curious what's happening in terms of the logs, if you're seeing errors or something else, you can jump in here and see where the errors are uh, and other information such as the inbound and outbound metrics. We also have for workloads, if you're, uh, we have an optional way of adding in your own custom dashboards for workloads. And I think we have this under the Kiali one in this environment. I'm not sure if it is or not. Um, but for Kiali, yeah, it's not in here. But there's an option that you can use that will allow you to create your own dashboards within Kiali. So if you have custom metrics that you want to show, you can show them. If you're running a Go application, you can have your Go application metrics being shown in here. If you have custom um, metrics that you have in here, you can also do it as well. We have a CR, a custom resource that you need to define that will set that up that can be quite handy. We've used that quite a bit with Kiali with some of our debugging is that we've made it easy to see what certain functions in Kiali are taking longer than others to perform. So we've had some problems. We had some issues with um, certain endpoints taking a long time to reply back and we've used that to kind of debug and look into those issues. There's also, you know, a bunch of other things in here, but I'm sure people can uh, go through on their own and probably look at these a little bit more. Just kind of looking at these issues on their own is a little bit, I think, dry. So um, I'll get more into a, a little bit of a demo here. So in this instance, oh, I want to get rid of the Istio system. We have something like, let's say, ratings, where we have V1 and V2. And let's say I want to send 90% of my traffic to V1 and 10% to V2. So if you want to do that, first of all, you can check right here by saying the percentages and seeing what it is right now. So we see that the traffic's about 50-50 between the two, but we want to change that. So we can click on ratings, then go into the rating service. And from here, we have some actions that you can perform. So you can create a weighted routing route. So I can say I want V1 to have, what I say, 90%, and then uh, V2 to have 10. And I can create this. 
This has now been created. You can now see that I have my virtual service here. That's been created. You can see the, uh, the weights that we have with this. You can also go into the YAML here if you want to uh, edit the YAML directly. Um, if there's also problems in your YAML, it'll highlight things. So I think if you were to do something like, um, let's call it V2 Mongo, I, I don't know. When you change the weight, uh, that was changing the weight on a subset. How did the tool know, was the tool showing subsets or deployments or pods or what? Uh, I'll go back to that action. Well, I can delete this one right now. Well, here, I'll go back. So I'll, uh, what was I on? I on ratings, didn't I? Sorry, yeah. So I can update it here. So it knows what workloads um, are available. Right. And but by workload, does that mean pods or deployments or what? Subsets? It's going to look at that's a good question. I'm not sure how exactly we get this in here. I think what it's doing is it's looking at the various uh, pods that are, or sorry, workloads that are available behind the the service itself, which would be subsets. Yeah, v1 and v2, but it'll it'll create the subsets for you. So if you go back in here and you go into ratings, I, I guess I would be curious for so how, for how some of this stuff scales if there's more than one pod in a deployment, like how the graph looks. Well, it's not based on the like individual pods themselves. It's based on workloads. Workloads, okay. So if you have a deployment that has you know V1, it can have 10 pods. That's still the deployment V1 workload, for instance. Right. But the graph is showing workloads, meaning deployments, and not individual pods. Yes, there is. Uh, there, there's no concept. Well, there is a concept in the telemetry that you could get individual pods in there, but the way the telemetry works is that it's looking more at the workload level, which a workload can be composed of multiple pods. That makes sense. I just, I guess, because I didn't see anything like a count or anything on these V1, V2, and V3, I was thinking that they were the V1, V2, and V3 pods, but they are the deployments. Yeah, well, if you look at it like a, the, yes, it's, pods aren't really a, a concept in what we're dealing with with the telemetry, and I don't think it's even a concept with any of the YAML files. It's, it's all dealing with workloads themselves, which for a lot of simple examples here, like the, the V1, this is composed of, um, if I open the workload here, it's, it's just one pod. So if you're like dealing with the default hello world example, a lot of the times it's just a single pod in the workload, but there's there's nothing to stop you from having 10 or 20 of these that are running. So so we define like um, um, a deployment for each uh, variation of the service. Not one deployment. Means that we have like, if we have V1, V2 and V3, uh, we should have three deployments. Each deployment is uh, is bucket for 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 the specific variation of the service. Yeah, you can't have uh, you can't have a deployment that would have different v1, v2, and v3. It would all have to be the same. It's not possible okay. to have um, mm -hmm. pods under deployment that have different labels. Technically, yeah. if you have a replica set uh, based workload, then you could have pods underneath it that would be from the same replica set but would have different version labels apply, but it's kind of a, a, a different situation that we're, it's not really, I think it's more of an anti-pattern to be doing things that way. For most things, we're expecting users to be doing deployments. If they do do it that way, which is kind of funky, I mean, it does still work. It's just not usually a, a way people, uh, people handle it. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about the, the config? Uh, the, 
the process of creating the virtual roles, virtual services from the UI was interesting. Are, are you planning on doing more of that type of config creation using Kiali in the future? Uh, yes. So, like right now, we have the the weighted routing that you can go through and and modify. Um, you can also do things like if I want mutual TLS to be enabled, I can go in here and click mutual TLS or change the the, um, the load balancer settings. Uh, then now, if you go back, you'll see that the traffic is flowing with, with mutual TLS enabled. We also have an option for I'll delete some of these and start again. There's also options if you want to do. Uh, a matching routing. So, for instance, if you want to, you know, have a header that has a certain value in it, and you want to route based on that, then you can do that as well using um, this other configuration uh, wizard. There's also options that we have in here, which is suspend all traffic. So, if you decided that you something's wrong and you need to kick traffic going to uh, certain workloads, you can come through in here, check a box, and automatically uh, suspend all of it so traffic stops flowing through it. This is just kind of a start of what we have for the configuration. We're looking to uh, expand that and make it easier for people to, to handle things. So I think for now, it's it's quite nice to have something like the, um, you know, being able to use a, these kind of bars to specify how much traffic goes to each one. I don't need to worry about any YAML files. I can create, hit create, and it's automatically, it creates the virtual services and destination rules for me. Um, so that's what we found to be useful. But yes, we're expecting to add more in there. Uh, even with the things that the virtual service is, we have like kind of a page here, you can see it, but there's also a, a YAML file that, um, you know, if you, if you want to, you can go through and edit the YAML file. You can also, I think, delete it from here uh, if you want to get rid of it. I don't think we have create. Uh, at the moment, just because we found that creating things, at least just from a pure kind of text wizard, is not that handy. We'd rather use, or sorry, from like a text field, not that handy. We'd rather use wizards for people to create things. Um, and then even, which is, I think we've shown before, but we can update things like um, the, the YAML directly. So if I, say, say I had it called ratings instead of ratings, it can like update and show you that you have errors specified in your YAML because you know the host here is not found. Uh, and then you can fix it by ratings, hit save, and then it's it's green again. So you can't apply new YAML. Like I I wouldn't be able to just use a separator and then put more YAML underneath the as a, a second config underneath the virtual service. That is interesting. I don't know. I've never tried to do that. Um, Okay, it's not allowing me to do it. Okay, so it might prevent me from actually trying that, but that might be a possibility. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just use Kiali to do a complete end-to-end -end Istio demo, like to the point where if, if you take the prerequisite that you have a cluster with Istio installed and, and, yeah. and an application that's not part of the mesh, can I just use Kiali to add that application to the mesh, uh, maybe like enabling sidecar injection for a namespace? You know, somehow trigger it to restart, pick up that Envoy, and then add virtual service routing, and then apply, and then do the whole thing. That would be very cool, I think, but it's not something that we've thought about yet. But that is very interesting, especially to be able to take something like an existing application and just like clicking on it and saying, you know, add if, if, yeah, if you apply this. Um, right inject the, the sidecar or whatever to this and, and continue. That would be very interesting. It might also be interesting if we could, I think, also create YAML files maybe in here somewhere or allow someone to upload a YAML file. So instead of having to go to the command line and do uh, cube control, you know, create dash F this file that I got somewhere, if they could just, you know, copy and paste it into something or upload a file, that might also be uh, interesting for us as well. Yeah, I agree. I think that would really help the, the new to Istio users who just want to play around, kick the tires, and this would be a good onboarding experience. Yeah, agreed.
Yeah, I guess this is kind of like the Istio CTL meshify command that's been discussed in this work group early on, but it's more on the UI level. What can we do to make our user life easier? If they come to Kayali, they're looking at this, not just observe what's going on within their mesh, but also adding services to their mesh right from the UI. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. I'll write that down and add it into our, our issue tracker that we should be doing something like that. Okay. Any other questions what people have seen so far? Um, the, the security aspect, uh, what do you think the future of, uh, of, of Kiali is on, on how you would log in and sell, set up your own registry, <laughs> et cetera? Uh, so could, you, could you repeat that? Uh, how would you, in the future, um, are, are you planning on doing more things with uh, authentication so that you can connect it to an existing, like OAuth registry or something? Yeah, there's been a, some interest in that on our, our mailing list so far. So right now we have three different uh, authentication mechanisms. You can log in with a simple username and password. You can uh, not have any authentication and log in as like an anonymous user if you really want to, although that means anyone who accesses Kiali has access to uh, everything in there. And then we also have a integration with the OpenShift OAuth that allows you to log in with your OpenShift credentials. And that's also tied in with your permissions in the OpenShift cluster. So if you're running OpenShift and use that option, if there's say like, 10 different namespaces in your cluster, but you only have access to one. If you log in with your credentials, Kiali will only show you that one namespace. So we've had some things about, you know, potentially using something like generic OAuth where anyone can configure OAuth to get into Kiali. Um, we're, I'm not sure exactly how we want to handle that at this point. I think the OpenShift one, it's kind of a special case because it's tied in with their permissions in the cluster. If you wanted to see OAuth in Kiali, would you expect that just to be like a simple pass or fail filter to get into Kiali or expect more things to be in there from that or kind of what would be the 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 use uh, case? Just, just pass fail. So okay. just like the OpenShift uh, use case you mentioned, uh, being able to use the existing username and password from an existing uh, OAuth registry. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's. I mean, we already have some of the OAuth stuff with uh, OpenShift. It should be possible for us to extend that into generic. So that should be okay. Yeah. I mean, it looks like yeah, it's really uh, maturing um, and kind of placing itself as the de facto Istio dashboard. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to see, like, you know, what this group and the Istio users uh, would want to see from from Kiali being positioned like that. Yeah, that could be. I mean, it's one of the things that we're trying to figure out is, you know, how to work. I think better with the Istio community, how to make sure that we're getting nice feedback on what things should be done here, how to also collaborate potentially on some other tools and stuff around what's happening with either observability or configuration. Because um, I think this is you know, partially kind of a pain point for some people is to set up the configuration and get started in, in Istio and how we can make that easier for users to, uh, to get started and to go through with things. Just one more thing I wanted to bring up is that we also have integration with uh, Jaeger. So if you have Jaeger running, you can go through and grab some of the Jaeger uh, information in Kiali itself. So get the trace values in here. Uh, same thing if you're looking, I think, at services. You can also have a link to get uh, Jaeger information about your service directly uh, in Kiali without having to leave. Um, and I think those are the, the big features we wanted to kind of uh, go over and discuss. Um, before I go back, before I go back to the slides and kind of have my last one about the, you know, kind of future of Kiali. Is there anything else people want to look at or 
discuss here? So just a quick question on the Istio dashboard. Is there any plan to integrate that into Kayali, or do you envision people will continue to go to the Grifani for Istio dashboard and uh, maybe Kayali for the rest? So I think it's not configured in this environment, it's configured on my other one, which kind of died at the start of this, um, this presentation. But normally, if you go into something like the, the metrics page, oh, we have it right here. I don't know if this is going to work, but you can go directly to the dashboard from a link, and it should pop up and show you your, your dashboard in, in Grafana. Um, so here you can go from you know, seeing our simple graphs that we have displayed to going to the Grafana dashboard and seeing more information in here. I view them, I think, kind of as complementary, as the uh, Kiali ones are designed to be a little bit more, um, you know, something simple to look at and get things done, whereas people going to Grafana might want more configuration options. So from our Kiali page, you can't configure what's happening with the dashboard. So if you want to add in um, something else or, or modify the, the graph in any way, you kind of can't do that from the Kiali one, whereas in Grafana, you would be able to. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think it might be useful to still have the Grafana dashboards, um, but I think for most users, they probably could continue to use Kiali to go through and view things. Like there's some interesting things in here where you can do things like um, see metrics going directly from different versions of applications. Oh, this is not a good one because it's coming from um, the ingress, but if you look at something like ratings, I can go in here and metrics, and I can do something like show me what's talking to ratings. So the remote app is reviews, and I can show like what version is coming through. So I can see the metrics just for V1 and V2. So that's the metrics for uh, V2. That's for V3 at uh, both the same time. You can also do things like if it's, you know, I have multiple versions of my ratings app as well, I can see that, like, these are the metrics that are going from V1 uh, of ratings to V2 of services. Same thing, this is V1 of ratings to V3 of reviews. Um, it's kind of nice that way you can kind of go through and see things. But uh, whether, you know, Grafana still needs it or not, I think it's, it's probably still something interesting to have in there. Although Kiali is trying to provide a, a nice solution just based on what it can provide. But when you do a view in Grafana, it's just proxying the your request to the, to the existing Grafana instance? Yeah, it just opens up like it's you can pass to Kiali where the Grafana dashboard is right. okay. available from, and then it just opens up in a new tab that dashboard. Got it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's much better than I had thought. So at least user can use this as a central point, and then if they need more info, they can always click on viewing Grifana tab. Yeah, I think like the idea is we want to provide enough information to get someone you know started or solve you know most of their issues. But mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be use cases that Grafana is going to be better for things. Um, for workloads, we can show something like logs in there, but we're not going to, we're just getting the logs from the uh, Kubernetes side of things. We're not getting it from any other, you know, log aggregator, but we're not trying to rep, like rep, replicate what Elasticsearch is doing, for instance. Like if you want that kind of functionality, you should go to another service. So we're trying to provide a, a good kind of default view of things. And if you need kind of this more power user things, you might want to go to uh, something else, kind of get a view there. But for you know, eighty percent of things, we're hoping you can get that you know completed without any problems in Kiali itself. Yeah, very cool. Okay, uh, I just have one more slide, and that's it. I know that it was brought up um, a couple of uh, user groups ago about the Kiali roadmap. Um, so. Kiali really focuses more on things like ethics and stories, you know, trying to make things easier for people who are using Istio, how to provide some, you know, insight to what's happening. Um, we're 
hopefully fairly good at you know getting suggestions from the community into Kiali itself. Uh, we seem to be fairly active on our mailing list and IRC, so people have issues that go there and ask, and we, we tend to go through and get those into uh, Kiali versions pretty quickly. Um, you know, as part of this, we know we are looking for you know feedback and working more with the Istio community to get more features and functionalities into Kiali and to see where we can go with that. In terms of something more like a roadmap, um, we're, we're not really using that too much right now. We kind of look at things more in three-week sprints, um, which people should be able to see from our, our JIRA instance. So at the start of the three weeks, we look at what users have requested or what issues have been brought up, uh, prioritize those, and add it to the sprint. And at the end of the sprint, we kind of redo that again. Um, and that's how we've been adding in feature functionality to Kali all along. Um, and then kind of like our main goals are just to make it easy to manage and observe what's happening within a Istio service mesh um, and to also, you know, kind of expand and become a more active community around other uh, microservice observability for things. So that's sort of our roadmap. I don't know if that's helpful to users or if it's, you know, maybe a little bit not too much detail, but that's ma mainly how we've been dealing with things so far. Thank you, Matt. That's great. Yep. Um, so uh, we, we're running a little low on time. Um, we've been thinking about talking about the uh, Istio controls and shell completions, but there may not be time for that. Um, is that okay, uh, Eric? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, Jason wasn't going to make it today anyway, so moving oh, it to perfect. next week will be fine. So I went I went through and made a list of those UX items that have issues that are flagged for one two that have not been done that don't have owners. Um, I was hoping to um, see if anyone here wants to take on these items so that I don't have to um, pound on people uh, offline. Um, we have uh, we have an issue for. Um, it, Configuring the Grafana Prometheus dashboards to respect the Helm uh, settings. Uh, this one could be small. Maybe it could be impossible to, I'm not sure. Uh, it looks pretty easy, so maybe somebody should check it out. Um, the next item is more important. I think it's um, this Istio control install item. I'm happy to work with anybody on the design of this or implementation. This is, um, using Istio control to make it sort of easier to install Istio in the way that we think maybe Linkerd or um, other service meshes are take, take less work to install some of the profiles. Um, we have an item for Istio control proxy status. I think we have an idea for how to implement it. Proxy status has not worked properly in the multi-cluster case. And that's what this one is for, proxy status and proxy config, to have them deal with two different clusters at a time, one cluster running pilot and one cluster running Kubernetes um, if, if in the sort of split horizon view. We have a documentation item. I don't know if we have Frank here uh, to document the trust level of the attributes that are being uh, produced. And then we have um, an old item that I believe Sriram recently tagged for one two to improve Istio control validate to handle Kubernetes items. I believe Kuat is making it not complain about Kubernetes items, but I believe Sriram wants more. He requested that um, we check the Istio conventions. You know, I'm thinking of stuff like the port names having to start with HTTP and things like this. So those are the items I'm really hoping we get volunteers to take up uh, and soon so we can get them into one, two. If anyone has questions on these items, uh, great. If you think you could do them, um, just assign yourself or let me assign you. And uh, if no one does, I'll be begging people later on in the week. 
So just really quickly on the two first two issues, it still install is going through a freeze in the source code. We just moved the it's still modular install uh, from ecosystem to it's still org yesterday. So it's going to be rebased on the new thing. So it needs to be an agitation gone through the new thing because uh, it doesn't make sense for us to build the configuration or the tooling based on the older version of our install for one two. Okay, thank you, Lynn. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. Do we have any uh, topics for two weeks from now that we want to get on the agenda? Does anyone have a demo they want to give in two weeks? So are these all the work items provided for one, two? Do we have, because I noticed the other work group have been doing is they have uh, one centralized work item and then they have many work items linked to that one to reflect their work for one, two. Do we have something like that for this work group to kind of have a his, his holistic view to see, you know, what's going on for one, two beyond these? That, that's a good point. So I can make an epic um, for all the work that has been tagged as one two. There are some items that don't have a version or have nebulous future, and we should um, the steering committee and uh, this work group should try to decide what features we want to get in for one two. Um, I know everyone has their own favorite pet projects, but I want to make sure that nothing important that we think is going to go in gets missed. One, two is supposed to be a lot about code more of and testing. And I've certainly been working to get this thing to integrate with the more of uh, testing framework, but it would be also wonderful if we could get some of the UX features that people are demanding in on the roadmap for one, two. Right, exactly. So maybe as part of the agenda for next meeting, it would be nice to go through those and uh, ask the community uh, here at the work group meeting to prioritize them. I, sh I assume you have a lot, uh, probably have a very long list. That sounds great, Lynn. Okay, thank you, Ed. Okay, any last things before we end the meeting? All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye.